Welcome, my name is Robert Burati, and uh, today's lecture is on Alistair Crowley, Paul Gauguin, and an insight into the roots of esoteric art. And for the purposes of time, I'm really just going to focus the talk on the relationship between Crowley and Paul Gauguin, which, which is a fascinating one. Although the two men never met personally, they, they followed in many ways a similar path. Like Crowley, Gauguin suffered absolutely abominable press during his lifetime, uh, an, onslaught, an onslaught which really relegated his art to the curious ramblings of a very old man. And uh, this, this sounds vaguely familiar to us now, but um, I'd like to start by reading a tract from, from Crowley's diary uh, during his time in Chefalu. He writes, I feel easier but overexcited. Gauguin lit literally torments me. I feel as if by my own choice of exile rather than toleration of the bourgeois, I'm invoking him. And this painting of my house seems a sort of religious magical rite, like the Egyptian embalmers, but of necromancy. I would he might f come forth his pleasure on the earth to do among the living. I gladly offer my body to his manes if he need a vehicle of flesh for new expression. I could never have done quite that for any other spirit. I have been faithful to my own genius. It is maddening to think that I might have known him in the flesh. He died in 1903, May 8th, 11 months before the first day of the writing of the Book of the Law, just six months after I had met Rodin. I feel very specially that I should consecrate my house to him, not to Beardsley, a quite inferior type deriving from pifflers like Burne Jones and the over-elaborate school of Japanese, while he snivelled and recanted disgustingly when his health gave way. So by the power and authority invested in me, I, Baphomet, 729 ordain the insertion of the name of Paul Gauguin among the more memorable saints in the Gnostic Mass. So there was an obvious high regard held for Gauguin by Crowley. He was quite literally tormented by him when he was in Chefalu and and followed the same path of consecrating his house um, as a sacred space. And this was something which was covered in the press of Gauguin's time. They thought it was absolutely you know, strange behaviour by a, a guy who'd gone out to a Tahiti and just lost the plot. And, uh, and that, that perception of him as an artist really followed on for many years after that. And uh, there was an article in The Telegraph in the UK uh, in 2010 which was written to promote, uh, which was at the time the first major exhibition of Paul Gauguin's work in probably 50 years, uh, was written by a journalist called Alistair Smart. I'll just read a little bit of it here to provide an insight. He, he begins, Life is not easy as a Paul Gauguin fan. You're on the defensive too much to be effusive. Gauguin was both a syphilitic pedophile and an artist more important than Van Gogh. See the problem? Foul man, fine artist. Some say our knowledge of the former should change our opinion on the latter. Others, myself among them, think otherwise. He goes on to write, The trouble that we aesthetes have, though, is that in Gauguin's case, just like Van Gogh, his life was so dramatic, it's hard not to read the biography onto the art. Indeed, much of the power of his most famous works, the Polynesian Bay paintings, for example, derives from our uncomfortable knowledge of the context that they were created in. Although rendered innocent and unerotic, these brown-skinned nudes were more than just Gauguin's models, they were his sex slaves too. Feminists have justifiably given the Parisian a good hammering down the years. After dumping his wife and five kids, Gauguin up sticks to Martinique, Brittany, Arles, where he spent nine notorious weeks with Van Gogh in 1888, and finally the South Pacific Islands of Tahiti and Hivaoa. He took three native brides, infecting them and countless other local girls with syphilis. He always maintained that there were deep-rooted ideological reasons for his immigration, that he was quitting decadent Paris for a purer life in the South Sea's paradise. But one wonders how pure things really were in the hut he christened La Maison du Jour, the house of carnal pleasure. In short, posterity has Gauguin down as a sinner, and his posthumous punishment is a lack of exposure. That really sums it up. I mean, the way that he was considered in his lifetime was was outrageous. The the scandals. The you know, people wrote more about his scandalous lifestyle than they did about his art. And around the time of this article, there was a, a forthcoming retrospective at the Tate Modern, 
and, uh, and, and as I said, it was um, the UK's first major Gorgon show in 50 years. And you contrast, contrast that with um, a show previous, uh, it was a few months previous to, to this exhibition at the Royal Academy. Uh, it was uh, a show of Van Gogh's artwork, and that was considered a marketing masterstroke. The, the exhibition showed the Dutchman's work alongside letters that he wrote, diary entries, um, uh, diaries of his brother, and what was fascinating about that exhibition was the public interaction. The public were probably more interested in his life than his art, and um, avidly we look for the story behind the art, for a glimpse into the mind of what we perceive to be a genius, um, almost disregarding the very reason that we proclaim genius to begin with, which is the paintings themselves, the artwork itself. So essentially we have, in this case, the reputation of the man undermining the importance of his art. And it's taken nearly a century for people to start looking at Gauguin's work for what it is and appreciate it without the associated bad press that it's always had. Um, I believe that we're on the cusp of a similar resurgence with Aleister Crowley and indeed the esoteric art, occult art genre as a whole. So let's, let's start with a bit of an overview on Paul Gauguin's life. He was born on the 7th of June, 1848. If you had to sum up his artistic legacy in a nutshell, he favoured an emotional response to nature over the intellectual use of line, colour, composition. Um, in short, he was interested in what something felt like rather than what it looked like. Uh, Gauguin Ryan, uh, resigned from a successful career as a Parisian stockbroker to devote himself to painting. Though he had little formal training, he was, he was largely self-taught. He was extremely unsuccessful when he started. Uh, he lost all of his money pretty quickly. He, he, he lost his wife. He lost his five kids. Uh, you know, he found pretty quickly that the life of an artist isn't what it's always cracked up to be, not even in Paris. So after a relatively brief stints in Martinique and Brittany, he moved to Tahiti eventually. Um, he was a, a bit of a nomadic soul at the best of times, but Tahiti was the spot where he finally felt at home. Uh, he took a native girl as his wife, moved into a small cottage, uh, which was famously known as the Maison du Jour, uh, House of Carnal Pleasure or Ecstasy, as it's more common known. He continued to completely fill the house with his paintings, and it's considered probably his most fervent period, and most prolific period of, of, of painting. And he really made some breakthroughs, um, but the house itself uh, was really a sacred space for him and his practice. He painted the door, uh, which is currently on show in the, uh, at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, and uh, I suggest you know, have a look at it <laughs> as soon as you can. It's, it's, uh, the, the, the artifact from the house are fantastic. He, he literally painted every wall with the aim of, of creating that sacred space on the door frame. Gorgon inscribed, uh, this was in 1901, he inscribed, be mysterious, be loving, and you will be happy. But uh, he spent the, mo the remainder of his life in, in relative seclusion with his, his various loves on the island and his painting, and not much else. Um, it was here that he sought to discover what he called pure nature, the pure nature of, of what it is to be human. So like Crowley, uh, Gorgon outlived two of his children. Um, his 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 favourite daughter, uh, Aline, died of pneumonia. His son Clovis died of a blood infection. So he, he had a lot of tragedy along the way. Uh, so his 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 art certainly didn't come without a share of uh, of pain. And once again, like Crowley, his retreat into rural life brought a share of backlash from the local authorities. In French Polynesia, toward the end of his life, he got into legal trouble for taking the native side against the French colonialists. In 1903, while living in the islands, he was charged with libeling the governor. He was given three days to prepare his defense. He was fined 500 francs and, uh, and sentenced to three months in prison. He, uh, he appealed against this decision at the second trial. He was once again fined 500 francs and sentenced to one month in prison. And uh, during this time, he was he wasn't ill. Uh, sorry, he he wasn't well. He was he was quite ill, and uh, he was actually being supported by his art dealer Ambrose Vallard from Paris. And uh, so it was it was certainly tough times. It wasn't a, a um, the picturesque 
uh, Tahitian lifestyle that you would imagine. It, it, was, it was a pretty tough time for him. Uh, he was suffering from syphilis quite badly. He died before the trial at 11 a.m. on the 8th of May 1903, uh, possibly of an overdo overdose of morphine, possibly a heart attack. Um, he, his body was already weakened considerably by alcohol and, uh, and quite a, a tough lifestyle. He was 54 years old at the time. And still on the island there remains a, re a reconstruction of the Maison du Jour on its original shorefront spot of Hiva Oa. And, uh, and judging by the number of living islanders who claim Gorgon as an ancestor, it would seem that his, uh, his final years were, were pretty active and <laughs> reasonably pre pleasurable. Uh, but, uh, but, but the reality of it, it you know, he, he was certainly having a tough time and a tough life uh, toward the end. But, uh, but this is the classic story of Gauguin, the outsider, the, the escapee, the artist who removed himself from society um, as an explorer to, to, uh, to find a better model of existence and to connect with pure nature, pure creativity. But for many years he was really forgotten following this. The vogue for his work started well after his death. Uh, many of his later paintings were acquired by various collect uh, private collectors. Uh, a substantial part of, of his, his work is actually displayed in the Pushkin Museum and the Hermitage. And, uh, I mean, these days, obviously, his work uh, is rarely offered for sale, and, and when they do, they can be as high as, as 40 million US. Uh, his poth posthumous retrospective exhibitions began in the, in the year of his death, and that was largely because of his, um, his art dealer, Ambrose Villard, who, uh, who really kept pushing... Uh, the importance of his work. So his first retrospective was, was in, in 1903, an even larger one in 1906, uh, which had a, a, a really powerful influence on the French avant-garde, and in particular P Pablo Picasso. And in autumn of 1906, Picasso made paintings of, of uh, oversized nude women, monumental sculptural figures uh, that clearly referenced the work of Paul Gauguin and showed his interest in primitive art. I mean, the power evoked by Gauguin's work led directly to Picasso's famous work, Les Damoiselles d'Avignon, in 1907. And this work is regarded as a groundbreaking work in art history. The art historian John Richardson wrote that the 1906 exhibition of Gauguin's work left Picasso more than ever in this artist's thrall. Gauguin demonstrated the most disparate types of art, not to speak of elements of metaphysics, ethnology, symbolism, the Bible, classical myths, and much else besides could be combined into a synthesis that was of its time, yet timeless. An artist could also confound conventional notions of beauty he demonstrated by harnessing his demons to the dark gods and tapping a new source of divine energy. Interestingly, Les Damoiselles wouldn't be exhibited until 1916. And, uh, and wasn't widely recognised as, as such a revolutionary achievement until the early 1920s, uh, when André Breton, the, the later founder of Surrealism, published the work in one of his journals. Gauguin felt that the religion and the philosophy of his age couldn't address the true needs of the spirit, and ultimately could not answer the eternal question of life and death. He did, however, feel that art could answer this question, and in the popular culture of his day, he was perhaps the most prominent example of the shift toward the concept of artist as prophet. And in 1888, Gauguin and the fellow artist Emile Bernard developed a new style called synthetism, which later gave rise to, rise to, uh, to symbolism. And, and to, to clarify the two, the, the term synthetism is, is uh, essentially to synthesize or combine um, to form a new complex um, visual statement. So it's, it's essentially bringing together the outward appearance of a natural form and melding that with the way the artist feels about that natural form. So the purity of the aesthetic considerations of line, colour and form are maintained because it creates a more well-rounded artwork. You're joining what it feels like with what it looks like and trying to, to discover a new insight. Um, it was certainly influential, but really it, it required a new language to be, to be built to really give, give the, uh, the concept form. Uh, symbolism, in contrast, is really the practice or the act of representing something via a symbol 
or investing things with a symbolic meaning or character. So um, essentially a symbol is an object, an action or an idea that represents something other than itself. In this period, a new model of the artist was being created and the artist became the prophet, a seeker of truth and beauty. And a new language was being developed to achieve all of this. So they had the ideas of synthetism, symbolism, and now they just needed that language. And that really fell to the artist's domain. And it was a real challenge. So in 1902, um, you know, for example, when, when Crowley was visiting Paris with Kelly, symbolism at that time was the main argument against uh, realist and naturalist thought, particularly as it applied to painting. And... Um, the key founding work in this tradition of symbolist painting was a, a particular work called The Talisman, which was painted by Paul Serusier in, uh, in 1888. Uh, this was considered the first attempt by a French symbolist artist to practice this new aesthetic, so basically to create the visual language um, to bring these ideas into form. So, and, and as the story goes, Serusier uh, found this language through instruction from directly from Paul Gauguin. Gauguin actually asked him, how do you see this tree? You know, pointing to a tree in the street. How do you see this tree? Is it green? Then paint it green. Paint it the most beautiful green on your palette. And that shadow over there, rather blue, don't be afraid to paint it as blue as possible. So in this way, bold and simplified colour patterns while they were influenced from the natural landscape, the artist became the crea creator and said, no, I'm going to paint it as strong as possible to really get the feel of how green it is, how lush it is. So you're, you're extending what you see into what you feel um, with the idea of getting that emotional reaction, really trying to find what that subject is really about. You're essentially trying to find the whole will of that subject. And when you think about it, much of this... Um, much of the artwork which would form Crowley's first exhibition you know, 17 years later in New York owes much to this approach, as do the works on show here today in the gallery from the, the Palermo collection, the, the Nightmare paintings, amplify colour. I mean, particularly his, his uh, depictions of the Sicilian sunsets. They, the sun is on fire, literally. It's how it feels. Back to, back to Paris in 1891, uh, the uh, critic Albert Ourier wrote an essay, Symbolism in Painting, clearly referencing Paul Gauguin, in which he defined the characteristics of symbolist painting, precisely the primacy of the idea and the necessity of clothing it in a synthetic form that would work by illusion. He stressed that the work should be subjective because an objective, an object would not be considered as an object, but as a sign or an idea perceived by the subject. So this was a major breakthrough, and particularly that work, The Talisman, was something that just gave symbolism, um, you know, the green light. Every, every um, painter picked up the challenge, and, um, and, and obviously you had artists like, uh, like Picasso who, um, and, and Braque and, and, and many others who were, who were heavily influenced by that approach, which, which was born by Gauguin. Uh, but three groups were specifically influenced by Gauguin's thinking in this in this, uh, in this area, the Pontivon school, uh, Les Nabis, and the circle of artists within the Salon of the Rose Croix. Now, the Pontivon school is is mainly known because of the groups that flocked around Gauguin, and um, and they were joined. They were actually joined by Paul Serrusier um, in the year that he painted the Talisman, and um, so they were collectively known as the Pontivon school because that's where they were based in Pontivon. Uh, the second group, Les Nabi, were a, a really interesting group. They were a, a really post-impressionist avant-garde artists, and they have been credited with really setting the pace for fine art and graphic arts, particularly in France in the 1890s. Uh, they were initially a group of friends interested in, in contemporary art and literature. Most of them studied at private art schools, uh, like the uh, uh, Académie Julien in Paris in the late 1880s. And so what bonded them together was that avant-garde period concept that, well, you know, painting has to be more than just painting a landscape or a still life photographically. You know, painting has to be more. Uh, painting has to be pure creativity where you're actually, as the artist, making a world, not just copying something that you see. 
and they took the term Nabi, which, which actually means prophet in Hebrew. And it was, uh, it was actually coined by the poet Henry um, Cazalis, who, who drew a parallel between the way that these painters aimed at revitalizing painting and the way that the ancient prophets had wanted to revitalize Israel. <laughs> and uh, there were also uh, ideas that you know, possibly the nickname arose because most of them had these big long beards. Uh, a lot of them were Jewish and they were all just desperately earnest. You know, they, they, were, they uh, regarded themselves as initiates to a new way of working and far removed from the rest of the community. Um, but they were specifically placed to unlock the potential of art on the spiritual plane. They used their own vocabula vocabulary. They described their studios as temples. They had a particular series of, of initials and lettering that they would put after their messages to each other, uh, which translated as, in the palm of your hand, my words and thoughts. And this single phrase really sets them apart from their contemporaries because that's their mission. At the heart of their practice was the idea that art can transform and that in the hand of the artist was the word and thought of the gods. And they paved the way for the early 20th century development of abstract and non-representational art. The goal of integrating art and daily life was a goal that they had in common with most progressive artists of the day. Um, they didn't want painting to be something that you do 9 to 5, then you go home and have your life, or you, you know, it's, it's, it's a job, it's not a, you know, a hobby, it's they want to integrate an, uh, their creative practice with their life in the same way that marrying your spiritual practice with your everyday life. They really saw no delineation between all of that together. So, so effectively their art practice wasn't about making a living. Um, although in, in 1890 they started to, um, to exhibit publicly, most of their paintings remained in private hands or in, in, the, in the possession of the artists themselves, they just wouldn't sell them. It wasn't about making money, it was about extending a genre of visual expression. And uh, among the artists that considered themselves Nabi was Morris Dennis, uh, whose, uh, whose writing actually put the aims of the group uh, right in the public eye. And he defined their approach to painting uh, very similar to Gauguin, who obviously was a direct influence of, of, of the entire group, but he defined their approach to art as saying, well, a painting is essentially a flat surface covered with colours assembled in a certain order, but a certain order, a thinking process between everything. Um, this really expressed the Navi approach. Crowley's Confessions make a, a, a very similar statement. He actually writes, the subject of a picture is merely an excuse for arranging form and colour in such a way as to express the inmost self of the artist. The notion that the artist was a seer or prophet who in the words of the symbolist critic of the time, Camille Mouclair, uh, painfully saved our sickened souls from the excremental muck of materialism. So art, they believe, had the potential to offer the kind of salvation that had previously been the, the terrain of traditional religion. This, old, this, this idea once again flowed into the Salon of the Rose Croix, whose exhibitions were held in Paris from, uh, from 1892 through to 1897. And uh, the order had been founded by uh, the self-anointed Tsar, uh, Joseph Peladin. Uh, Tsar was a title designating Assyrian royalty, so he, he felt he was worthy of that. He was a, a, a big character. A prolific art critic, and um, he, he was the author of a, a sort of local magazine on on uh, Androgenev. He was the a high priest of the occult, as he considered himself. Uh, the The main concept going through his writing and and his I guess propaganda, for the want of a better word, was his concept of the artist as the supreme priest, who should represent dreams instead of reality. Uh, he was a flamboyant character. He viewed himself and all of his public activities as a work of art. He interestingly coined a term uh, called caloprosopia to describe his art of personality in which he externalized an aesthetic idea in dress, gesture, and demeanor. And he would ultimately lead to the internalization of an aesthetic as a personality trait. He himself dressed in archaic silk robes. He affected the pose of a quasi-Byzantine mystic. He, he, 
he really used persona magic at the end of the day. He's creating a new form, a new persona, and uh, he, he, was, he was a master of that. Now from these groups, the three groups that were influenced by Gorgon, the Pontivon, the Nabi, and the Salon of, of the Rose Choir, some of the artists in these really, uh, they continued to follow Gorgon all the way through, and one of the things that they did follow and one of the things that Gorgon was became quite well known for and, and admired for was his great retreat from the world. I mean, he literally put his money where his mouth was. He said, no, to find pure nature, you can't do it in the middle of the city. If you're really going to uh, find freedom, you have to get out of there. And there was a book, uh, a novel, which was uh, published in 1884 by uh, Joris Karl Heisman. It was called uh, Audible or... or translated as against the grain or against nature in which the central character essentially withdraws into an elaborate world of his own construction in an effort to fully control his reality so within the confines of his of his new abode the differences between nature and artifice reality and imagination are stripped away and um, nothing of the natural world remains the transformation of the natural world into a product of his imagination is illustrated when the when he starts to decorate his whole home with a live turtle encrusted with gold and jewels. He was creating his own sacred space. He was controlling his own world and making his own sanctuary where he can find true nature. And this uh, this was a book that was floating around the artistic circles. Gorgon certainly had a copy. I believe Crowley had a copy, and Gorgon retreated many times. He, he was trying to get away a lot, <laughs> for, whether it was escaping a uh, scandal or whatnot, but he was, he was always on the move. So uh, the first time was when he tried to go to Brittany in the 1880s, which he thought would be an escape to a more primitive region of France. It wasn't primitive enough for him, obviously. Um, then obviously the, um, the infamous nine weeks with Van Gogh uh, in Arles. In 1891, Gauguin sailed finally to, to French Polynesia to escape European civilization and, and what he called everything that is artificial and conventional. Uh, he left France again on uh, 1895, never to return. Crowley began his own great retreat from the world in 1920 when he arrived in Sicily, establishing the Abbey of Thelema in Cefalu. Not only would it be a, a retreat from the savaging he was, he was getting in the, in the British press, but, uh, but he envisaged the Abbey as a spiritual retreat for the training of, of his disciples. And in this regard, he, he certainly took his cue from, uh, from the, uh, the Ordo Templi Orientis manifesto, which called for a hidden retreat, or a collegium at spiritum sanctum, where members may conceal themselves in order to pursue the great work without hindrance. And these abbeys, or prophet's houses, are, uh, as they're known, are secret fortresses of truth, light, power and love, specially consecrated by nature to bring out of a man all that is best in him. As, uh, as, as the writer Stephen J. King writes in the Nightmare Paintings catalogue, the Thelemites there seem to have been far removed from the ideal Crowley portrayed in fictionalised accounts, nor as romantic and, and as cool as the modern occult scene might imagine. Whilst for a time it was a rustic paradise for the Thelemites, as for Crowley with his newfound family life of wives and children, for the most part they were impoverished and struggling for basic provisions. Sanitary conditions meant illnesses were common and constant. Tragedy overshadowed them. Crowley's baby daughter died, his favourite student died, his unborn son was miscarried. He and the Thelemites were left shattered in a nightmare of grief and loss. The beast was increasingly dependent on heroin and cocaine. He was not alone. And the fine line between the ecstatic use of sex and drugs in sacred orgia and the downward spiral of excess was fine indeed. Tension and jealousies between students and lovers got in the way of the great work. And the parallels here are, are obvious. At the age of 43, Gorgan, a stockbroker, abandoned Europe for art and Tahiti, establishing his Maison du Jour, Crowley, at the age of 44, had abandoned England for the Abbey with his lovers and immersed himself in art. Crowley consecrated his Abbey to Gorgon. And for Crowley, art and magic were one, 
and the symbolist concept of the artist as prophet had really no better exponent than Crowley. Uh, Crowley wrote in his diary, the artist is a creative genius, that is, he is of the nature of Godhead, which defies the soul as a medium for self-realization. Also, as history assures us, the artist is of the cast of the initiated rulers of mankind. He understands the theory of the universe. He is an epoch of the mysteries of nature and a hierophant of the inviolable sanctuary. But the path to the subconscious ego is, no, is by no means an easy or even pleasant experience. It wasn't pleasant for Gorgon or Crowley. And, uh, you know, at, at least evoking deep-seated anxieties, fears, uh, repressed memories, desires, everything. All expressions of the dark, unconscious archetype of the shadow. Crowley made taking this descent into hell necessary training for the Thelemites at the Abbey. He called the main room the Chamber of Nightmares, painting the walls with grotesque murals. The purpose of these pictures, he wrote, is to enable people by contemplation to purify their minds. An indication of what the student encountered while in contemplation is actually given in the, in the descriptions of some of the murals. As you'll see in some of these artworks here on my right on the wall, uh, these are contemporary works by Australian artists inspired by the descriptions of some of Crowley's artworks and frescoes from the Chamber of Nightmares. So as you can see, they're, uh, they're quite imposing and uh, it would have been a, an interesting room to be sitting in and contemplating. His writing about art showed a, a clear intimacy with Gauguin's method and, and Gauguin's aim of art, but he extended it so much further into the spiritual realm, and certainly in a way that Gauguin was never able to do. Gauguin sought to paint what a subject felt like. He felt that this was a path to real knowledge. He would say, paint the tree as green as you possibly can. Crowley would reach further. He wrote, one should absolutely discover the true subconscious will of the detail of work for the time being before starting. The operation will then help to manifest in form. So Crowley's Thelemic art theory was rooted in his magical theory of the universe, and in particular, the central doctrine of knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel. The artist must discover the will of the work in order to manifest form as the magician must converse with the angel in order to discover his or her true will and accomplish it. Anything else was black magic. Anything else was bad art. The role of the artist is now joined with the art of the magician, whose central aim is to make the invisible visible. And that can often be <laughs> the definition of true art. And I've always been of the belief that a true artist and a great artist is a master of showing you things that you can't see for yourself. So do what thou wilt to manifest in form, to express the magical image, was comparable to the subconscious expressions of the true will. It was a matter of tuning in and letting true art or true nature flow. And the great work itself was a process of discovering the true self and enabling its expression and fulfillment by understanding and overcoming the complexes, the repressions that prevent it or pervert it. And uh, as Stephen J. King wrote in magical terms, that's the process of purifying the microcosm in order to unite it with the macrocosm. Crowley expressed his ideas actually in, in his Chefalu diary. He writes, there would be no fun, moreover, in creating dead things. The whole point of the game is that one's work lives and moves independently of one's conscious mind. It is not amusing to turn out objects according to a pattern, as any fa factory hand will tell you. My paintings are never what I wish to make them. They fight for themselves against my hand. I can't even correct what I see to be real errors as often as, as, often as not. The finished work always surprises me. Thus, each painting reveals an unknown part of me to myself. I gain real knowledge through my art. Is not that better fun than if it merely recorded my thought with mechanical precision? Art is a God's way, discovering his own mysteries, the most enthralling, most tireless of pleasures. Crowley's painting is a key aspect to discovering his knowledge. During his time in Chefalu, it was a major part of his magical work. It was his most prolific time as a painter, and as a tool which assisted his progression to the highest grade of AA, that of Ipismus, literally meaning own very self. So using Thelema, he perfected the model of the artist as prophet. 
He solved Gauguin's puzzle, and he extended the artist into the realm of the initiate and the magician. Thank you for listening.